Hi, I'm Jody Daly. And I'm Brian Sheriff. Well, 2012 has come and gone, and 2013 is here with new opportunities and new challenges, which is not to say that the old challenges were successfully resolved. A lot of important things happened in the year past. Super Value put itself up for sale. Walgreens bought Britain's Boots drug chain. Jim Senegal retired at Costco. And ConAgra finally made a deal for Railcorp. One historic milestone took place. For the first time in retailing, the percentage of grocery shopping at traditional supermarkets declined below 50 percent as consumers spend more of their shopping dollars at super centers, wholesale clubs, and limited assortment stores. Add in specialty fresh food chains and online shopping, and the transition taking place in the U.S. marketplace is truly dramatic. Without a doubt, store brands have benefited as the powerful emerging retailers have trumpeted their own brands, expanding assortment and quality in ways only dreamed of two decades ago. Three men stand out as the drivers of this transition, Jim Senegal, John Mackey, and Jeff Bezos. So what kind of leaders are they? Where did they come from? What does their kind of retailing mean for everyone else in the year ahead? We start our coverage with this report about Jim Senegal and Costco. Jim Senegal hardly looks like someone who would start a revolution. With his tireless, plain Oxford shirt, receding hairline, salt and pepper walrus mustache, and bemused smile, Senegal seems ideally cast as the owner of an old-fashioned general store. But appearances really can be deceiving. Three decades ago, Jim co-founded Costco and created what would become an amazing international success story. A company with annual sales of more than $95 billion from around 600 warehouse club stores in North America, Asia, and Europe. Jim didn't invent the warehouse club format. He perfected it. I had worked for a gentleman by the name of Saul Price at FedMart and later at the Price Club. And what we had done was taken some ideas that we had seen in cash and carry in Europe, along with uh, hypermarkets, and we kind of put something together that was a combination of the two. So we kind of borrowed some ideas from three or four different formats and put them all together. From that, he transformed what many regarded as a quirky, limited West Coast retailing concept and turned it into a powerhouse that not only spawned imitators, but forced supermarkets and mass merchants to change their merchandising in significant ways. What did Jim Senegal understand about shopping that all the retail experts missed? He understood that shoppers enjoy surprises. So when you walk into a Costco, you're bound to see some really intriguing items for the first time. It could be a 10-pound package of gourmet Italian sausages, an internet TV, or perhaps an elaborate first aid kit. Not only didn't you see these products on the previous Costco trip, chances are you won't see them again on your next one. But Senegal also understood that shoppers want value. Before Costco, conventional retail wisdom said that stores should offer different levels of quality, ranging from the lowest priced items of questionable quality to the highest priced products of top notch quality. Shoppers were left on their own to figure out which products were really good values. Costco shoppers don't have this worry. The retailer rigorously edits its assortment of 4,000 SKUs so that only high quality products are offered. This emphasis on high quality and real value has played an important role in the success of Costco's store brand program. The retailer won't even consider adding a store brand product unless its quality at least matches that of the best national brands. Now, after 30 years, Jim Senegal has retired as Costco's chief executive. His approach to retailing, which seemed so revolutionary when he started out, has built one of the strongest consumer franchises in the world. Back to you, Jody. Thanks, Tim. The increasing expansion of the fresh format and specialty food chains had its impact in 2012. The number of stores reached over 900 outlets last year, with sales at nearly 15 billion. But the king of the format has been Whole Foods Markets, which opened 20 stores in 2012 and brought sales to nearly $12 billion. Its goal to triple its store count to 1,000 outlets will push many retailers in 2013 to re-examine their competitiveness in the fresh format. Roy White reports. Bring up the name of John Mackey, and of course you think of Whole Foods and what great stores they have, but you also have to think about what these stores have really done. 
Whole Foods has been an important force in taking the natural and organic lifestyle right into kitchens and dining rooms across America. In the process, the chain transformed organic retailing from small independent stores into one featuring large, up-to-date corporate stores. In addition, almost all retailers now merchandise this market with sections, promotions, and products. The vision was right there from the start. At 25, already a committed vegetarian and later a vegan, he decided in 1978 to do something about his beliefs. He raised $45,000 and opened a health food store. Mackie and his girlfriend lived together in the store and worked the aisles all day. In the process, they developed a format for organic natural selling and launched Whole Foods in 1980. Well, I'd like to say there was some uh, brilliant uh, master plan, but honestly, my girlfriend and I um, just thought it'd be really cool to start our own natural food store. We thought it would be fun. The net result has been that John Mackey and Whole Foods have been a factor in turning the natural and organics lifestyle from being a counterculture on the fringes of society 30 odd years ago into a mainstream trend today. In 2010, 4% of America's food and beverage sales were organic. Organic products alone are a $25 billion market. They were nothing in the 1970s. Mackey propelled this trend forward by demonstrating that it could be the basis for a major chain with 329 stores, over $10 billion in sales, and $345 million in net income last year. Averaging under 40,000 square feet, they feature 21,000 SKUs of organic, natural, or healthy products, merchandise in line, or at one of the many specialty departments and sampling stations. With their upscale decor, they are based on a vision developed by Mackey. The vision calls for exceptionally high standards to provide shoppers with the best quality and most affordable organic products in the nation. No artificial colors, additives, or preservatives are allowed in any product on the shelves. John Mackey and Whole Foods have come a long way since their first store in Austin, Texas. And as they have grown, they have taken the entire food industry with them. Back to you, Jody. Thank you so much, Roy. As warehouse clubs and fresh food specialty chains continued to transform the marketplace last year, another company, without bricks and mortar, was making sounds like it could become a major competitor in the future, if not in 2013. How much of a competitor can Amazon be? To understand Amazon, you have to understand its founder, Jeff Bezos. As a boy, Jeff Bezos converted his family's garage into a science lab using an old umbrella and tinfoil to make a solar cooker, and even trying to turn an old Hoover vacuum into a hovercraft. This spirit of invention, along with attention to detail, helped Bezos revolutionize retailing as founder of Amazon.com. His parents indulged his aptitude for science at an early age, and he attended Princeton University, where he studied theoretical physics, intending to follow in the footsteps of his heroes, Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking. But his first love was computers, and he graduated summa cum laude in 1986 with a degree in electrical engineering and computer science. He turned down lots of offers from companies like Intel and Bell Labs to join a Wall Street startup called Fitel that was building a computer network for international trading. The idea didn't pan out, and Bezos moved on to Bankers Trust Company and then to D.E. Shaw and Company where he was put in charge of exploring new internet business opportunities. It was here that he came up with the idea for online book sales. He knew that books were the simplest things to sell online because the largest distributors in the country already had extensive electronic lists. Amazon was launched in 1994 with $40,000 in seed money from family and friends. Packing and shipping was done in the garage of his new home in Bellevue, Washington, where old doors were used as tables. When Amazon.com took off, and it, it took off in a way that we never expected. Uh, I mean, I, I have to tell you right now, I am the most surprised person on the planet. Today, Amazon has annual revenues of $48 billion. It's become the ultimate in one-stop shopping and one of the most efficient retailers in the world. Those who know Bezos often describe him as an easygoing, happy-go-lucky kind of CEO. 
But he's also a driven micromanager. In 1999, Bezos was Time Magazine's Person of the Year. What's next? Well, Bezos isn't saying. It could be expansion of cloud computing or video and music streaming. Recently, the company launched a new business offering loans to online sellers. It might even be space travel. Bezos founded a company called Blue Origin to build a spacecraft using private funds. This may seem a long-term vision for some, but not for Jeff Bezos. Jody, back to you. Thank you, Lynn. Well, Brian, how do you expect the transition of retailing to play out in 2013? Well, Jody, that's a very good question, and I asked several of our industry gurus to comment. Joe Azanero, PLMA's chief researcher for this project, David Scarry, who recently retired as co-CEO of RailCorp, and Michael Sansolo, co-editor of Morning Newsbeat and former vice president at FMI. Traditional supermarketing is now down to about 49% of the grocery dollar. Somebody has to have caused that. In part, uh, Costco draining off sales of the kinds of products they sell. Um, same might be said of uh, uh, Whole Foods at the upper end and the natural and organic. And then definitely the question of, of click and shop as compared to going into the store. Um, are we at a point where retailing is transitioning to a new place in time? Uh, or is it simply another phase of, of an ongoing evolution? That's really, I think, why we thought of them as revolutionary. Yeah, I, you know, I would agree with you on that point of them being revolutionary. They have altered the path of retail. And Let's be honest, it's not going to go back to the way it was. I think if, if we were to estimate 10 or 15 years out, there's no reason to believe that Amazon will still be a bit player. We have a generation coming into adulthood, into their spending years, and they really like click shopping. And so a lot more is going to move there. I, I, I think the revolution that they have created and other retailers are reacting, but they're going to have to react faster. They are, these guys are focused. Their staff absolutely knows what they are. When you are in a Whole Foods, everybody in there, they're part of the movement. They understand what's going on. At Costco, they understand who they are and who they're not. And, and Amazon is supposed to be legendary for this. So I think other retailers are going to have to get it that you have to know who you are, who you're not. Everyone knows you can't be all things to all people anymore, but you must clearly identify who you're serving and accept. And that's why old measures might fall away. And it might be that traditional retailing goes away because no one's a traditional retailer. Everybody is doing something special. These guys are at the vanguard of that kind of work. If you look at the bios of the individuals and you look at the profiles of the companies, one thing that comes out is that the companies and the people who did it uh, change the relationship between the retailer and the suppliers not just on a store brand's basis. There's Costco saying to some of their best uh, suppliers, we want sizes that you have never been prepared to sell anywhere else, and which may compete with the products that you are selling in traditional supermarkets. There's a, a Whole Foods saying, we're looking for products that don't have national brand equivalents, that are unique, that are only going to be sold by Whole Foods, whether it's in our 365 or uh, as a brand. Uh, we want you to make those products for us. And then there's uh, Bezos and, and um, his organization saying, we're not even going to ask you to supply stores to a distribution center, uh, products to a distribution center or to stores themselves. We want you to work with us to send it directly to the consumer, which in effect uh, competes with all of your store relationships. So one of the, one of the differences perhaps uh, in, in what they've done is it changes the relationship between the retailer and their suppliers, which, which is a pretty, uh, pretty tough task in a, in a marketplace as mature as ours. David? Yeah, I, th I think that it, it was a difficult decision, especially when somebody starts out with two or three stores 
and you're trying to decide, do I change my whole operation because how many other two to three store operations have I seen before that you developed something for and then they didn't make it? I, I think over time, you kind of knew once they got to a certain level that they were going to be around for the long term. Uh, but those first few years to do, especially in private label, for somebody that was going to buy a thousand of something versus a hundred thousand and you had to change equipment or change packaging was a very difficult decision. In some cases, some suppliers decided they would never get in and once they got to a certain level of remembering who was with them at the beginning, it's very difficult for those people then get in at, at, when they get big enough to be able to be, in their mind, uh, a truthful, uh, truthful customer. So. And Joe, you followed their careers through the research that you did. Do you think that they realized what the impact of their ideas and practices would be? I don't be? think there was any way they could ever imagine the success that they've enjoyed, but I think that they each had a singular focus. In the case of Costco, it was value. In the case of Amazon, convenience. In the case of Whole Foods, uh, quality. And they have stuck to that, to those qualities. And with a singular focus and discipline, they really haven't strayed. 2013 is quickly taking shape. Store brands will continue to grow as retailers add SKUs. National brands will continue to fight back, trying to halt further erosion of their market share. Retailers will be squeezed by the proliferation of formats, all selling the same snacks and beverages and takeaway foods. And we will be here at the news desk to report the events and the trends. So for Brian and myself, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you for the next edition of PLMA Live.